Uh, it's my privilege to introduce our next guest. It's Maureen Fleming. She's the Vice President of Automation Research uh, at IDC. And I just wanted to come up here really quickly because she has a lot of great stuff to share with you. And a basis of a lot of this content are two new reports that uh, we've sponsored that IDC has put out that uh, I think will be fantastic for the crowd here um, if you're interested. So one of them is this ecosystem report that I quoted yesterday. Uh, you can download it by going to the website for Forward, uh, go to the agenda and find this session, and there's a link there. It's a preview, so we're releasing that more uh, broadly in the next couple of days, but want to make sure that you guys knew that was available. And then in the coming uh, week or so, we'll also have another report on personal productivity automation versus business workflow automation and how to run a program uh, that considers both, both what people do with tasks and deep end-to-end -end business processes and how you want to bring those two things together in one program. Um, so two great reports from IDC. Um, and so with that, to talk about uh, some of that research, please welcome Maureen Fleming to the stage. Maureen. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Diego. So uh, today we're going to spend some time um, looking at a new, um, new research that we put together that was sponsored by UiPath, looking at what the, what the economic impact is of all of this RPA stuff. I mean, is, there, is, there, is it something that's good for the economy in general and for the e economic um, health, of, health of the economy? And so I worked with uh, a group of other analysts. One was our, an IDC economist, and another one, uh, John Gantz, and then Jen, Jen Hamill, who's my counterpart, who looks at um, RPA and, and intelligent automation services. And I cover automation in general, um, particularly focused on software and a whole bunch of different kinds of software. And so we, we got together and combined a whole bunch of data that we manage at IDC along with a bunch of... Uh, government data and did a survey, and we came up with the results of this. And so that's what we're going to cover to begin with. So generally, um, just to net it out, um, the cumulative five-year return, the economic impact over a five-year period will be $129 billion for adopters of UiPath um, over the next five years. And so, you know, when you think about that, $129 billion is, is a huge number, um, and it's shared between partners, you know, the, the, the services channel, as well as you in terms of what you're doing with RPA and how it impacts your business. It's really hard to take $129 billion and think, well, what does that mean to me? So I spent some time, um, you know, trying to take this out of this whole macro world of, of the economy to more of, you know, what is it for a hundred dollars of spend? And so at that point, you start thinking about, um, you start thinking about what is the net benefit for putting some sort of automation in production? And so the way we built the model is that if you spend a hundred dollars on an automation, on, you, you know, building a bot and moving it into production, it, it, you know, within a year, then that $100 cost you $80, $80 that year. So you have a $20 net benefit by moving something into production that year. And because you moved it into production, you got a benefit. And that benefit doesn't go away. It, it accumulates so that the next year, you have an additional benefit, and the year after, and the year after. But each year, your costs go down for keeping that particular automation in production. So on the one hand, your first year, you're spending $80. By the time you get to year five, you've, you're only spending $34, and you're get, getting a benefit of, net benefit of $66 per, per $100 you move, use, use to move RPA into production and keep it in production. So it, it, the, the study itself shows that it, it, the automation actually works, and it drives benefit to the organization. And so what we also believe is that if you can think about um, that benefit and figure out ways to accelerate the benefit, 
um, earlier rather than later, then it, it, it improves things even more. So for example, it's logical to think about um, focusing on getting out fast and strong with the program, do your planning, but once you've done your planning, then commit and put resources in to really try to shrink your time to comp competency and broaden it out through the organization. The other thing that's happening is that there's significant changes in development environments, so RPA studios, that are making it simpler to use, so that it's, it's faster, you have some developed productivity, including the use of automation, to autom AI to automate development, and as well, just simpler, simpler ways to do things so that more people with fewer, less skills are able to actually meaningful do, meaningfully do their own development. And the third way that you can think about improving this impact or this net benefit impact is to move programs into, in, into a digital enablement for business users so that they can also um, you know, spend their $100 and get their kind of benefit because they're doing it for them and their teams to help them make their lives more productive. At this point, you should logically be thinking, almost you should probably have thought about this right at the beginning, well, what is an economic benefit? How do we arrive at that? And we figured out, we, so in our survey, we spent time asking a lot of different questions about different aspects of benefits and, and challenges. And we organized them into three categories. One is um, expense reduction. Are you using RPA to reduce costs? Or are you using RPA to do revenue improvement and finally quality? And you'll see absolutely logically that 44% of the, of the benefits come from cost savings, expense reduction. And that would include things like um, labor, auto, you know, labor automation um, and, and other things that you know, where you have less inefficiency, less waste. Um, so there's lots of different categories that, that, that drive into that expense reduction. But there's 41% went to revenue improvement. So on the one hand, you could use that labor productivity and move people over into an area where they can add value to improve customer satisfaction. Um, there could be a greater focus on, on, on making sure that, that things operate smoothly so customers are more satisfied. You, can start, you start seeing your retention rates go up with your customers, your cross-selling capabilities. You're reducing your inventory turns so that you are also um, you, you know, putting that money to work for you as well. And going to quality improvement, 15%, in, in that case, what you're, what's happening is that there's a lot of standardization that's going on so that you uh, make fewer mistakes. And the other piece about it is that you put different automations around validation so that if something is coming in incorrectly, you can quickly identify that as a mistake and fix it become, before it becomes a bigger problem. So when you think about economic benefit, it comes from multiple places um, when you're applying um, RPA and automation in general to to how you're running your business and improving how it runs. The other big question that everyone wonders about is, is if, you would, if you build out an RPA program, does that mean you're going to lay off a whole bunch of people? Are we looking at large-scale reductions in force and other negative impacts for people who really <laughs> need jobs? And we found that um, a couple of things that we found was that, that RPA in general is a net job gainer, so that we, we didn't necessarily see that job loss at all. We saw, the, in fact, the opposite. But the other thing is that even when you adopt, a pro, even when you adopt RPA, um, the direct, the direct um, impact to employees, only 13% of the people did have some kind of termina termination program in place because of that. But more, 17% reassigned people to other roles. And then um, another, got, another group of them had to stay, continue staying on their job because they, the, the business was growing. So they couldn't get rid of the people they, because they had to offset this increased business um, by using manual labor. The biggest impact on jobs is future. So, uh, so the, the key finding was that 41% of um, organizations that adopted RPA slowed hiring. 
And that was a significant impact. So you think about future workers, and you might want to worry about them, but that's beyond the scope of, of an organization trying to build an RPA program for themselves. When you think about this economically, you know, just in general, how many jobs did it create across the ecosystem? We built a couple of scenarios because it was so anti-intuitive to see how many jobs were created per one job lost. And so the pessimistic one was two jobs gained for one job lost. And that would be for people who get hired to actually do RPA, um, to start support the ecosystem that's built around RPA, and other types of things. And the, the optimistic says that there's, for every job lost, there are five jobs gained. So we think our happy path is sort of kind of putting that in the middle and saying it's going to be more than two to one, but it's going to be less than five to one. But when you think about it, either way, that's pretty significant when you think about automation technology. The survey itself was done in, it was done in, um, early in the early this year. So there could be some optimism for, for you know, it's, we asked them what's happened in your organization because of adopting RPA, and, um, and so that's what generated this, this sort of model. Um, and it could be that there might have been some optimism because, you know, vac vaccines were coming in and it was a less scary place to think about. Um, but in general, um, you know, the, the, the automation economy is actually a net job creator when, you know, at the end of the day. The other thing that's interesting is how, you know, looking at, for, for organizations that are doing technical training for their business users, they're creating a business, a business development, de developer skill for the line of business developers. Um, we found that 32% of UiPath customers or adopters said that they have a technical training pl uh, program in place to upskill employees. And, um, and that turned out to be something that was also beneficial. We found that 50% uh, that, um, of the new labor that was upskilled was actually hired, you know, was hired internally to the company into a new role. And then 50% of new labor came from new hires. So people who've been, who've been reskilled um, and upskilled generally were finding jobs inside their own organization. And the other thing is that those workers were upwardly mobile. Um, they had higher, higher roles than before, 57%, and 68% had higher salaries. So it was economically beneficial to each individual worker who was able to be upskilled for these sorts of programs. Finally, the technical training itself paid off. For those who successfully completed technical training, 28% were paid a salary greater than 20% of what they had prior to the upskilling, and 40% were paid 10 to 20% more. So there were also 28% were, were, were their salary didn't at all change. So you have to start thinking about, okay, how long are those upskilled people going, retrained and upskilled people, especially on RPA technology, going to stay in that organization um, or maybe go get one of the other new jobs that are created because of the automation economy, or, um, or they're somehow rewarded to really be enthusiastic about their new sets of skills. So many of you who are working on these sorts of programs and, and doing planning around, or doing planning around it, you have to start thinking about different ways to show benefit to these people who are going through a big effort to learn how to use this technology. Now, let's talk about technology. So for me, that's the, 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 the impact of this was so interesting to, to get the results back you know, as an analyst working on the topic of, of automation technology. But there's also, um, you know, if we look at state of automation, there's also a lot of changeover happening with tech. A couple of years, about when I first started um, uh, looking at RPA and how it fit into this broader sense of automation, I talked to so many customers who were equating RPA with automation as a sole form of automation. And that was really confusing to me because there's a lot of automation technology that operates in, in business operations. And in fact, the first time I looked at a company that said that, that was the equivalent of RPA before 
it became, our, before RPA was even coined as a term. Um, it, it, it was in 2007, a new, a new startup came into my, uh, my office at IDC and said, hey, I've got this really cool new technology. And um, I thought it was interesting. Um, I talked to a bunch of customers and I, um, about how they were adopting, and then I called it integration at the glass. So I classified RPA as an integration capability or a connectivity cat category when I first started looking at this technology. But now um, it's, it's really landed directly into um, labor-centric automation. So when you look at this model, um, but, but what, it always kept, what I always kept thinking about when I came up with this framework of intelligent process automation is that there's a thin line between one type of automation and another. And so this integration at the glass now is tied to, um, is tied to uh, improving employee productivity. And, and, so, and, and it's, that's always been the same for, for RPA. But what we're seeing is that um, with, when you look at the larger automation market, there are a group of swim lanes in it. One is automation planning, where you're doing process mining, task mining, modeling, to start understanding how your processes operate, to understand how your tasks operate, and with the goal of doing better planning to make sure that those all work better. Then we've got labor-centric, which is our process automation technology, intelligent document processing, and RPA. And also rules engines have been a part of that for a long time. And then on the system-centric side, you've got API management, integration, messaging, and event streaming, this whole Kafka type of stack that's unfolding in the market. All of those typically operate in their swim lanes, and I color-coded those so that you could see that how they sort of fit together. And um, RPA is a has classically been a standalone platform technology, and um, and then also the um, Kafka world and the stream processing and event, event stream processing are all sort of off by themselves. But that's changing rapidly. As, organ as vendors start seeing opportunity that they hear from their customers, that there's a bigger opportunity for them. And so, in, in essence, what they're doing is they're moving outside their swim lane to broaden out their capabilities so that they're able to address more automation needs for their, for their businesses or for their, um, for their customers who can then use that for, for their business. So there are four basic, so, and, and I call this multimodal automation platforms. And multimodal, it, we're in, in the AI team that I, I work within the AI and automation group at IDC. So multimodal means there are different styles of technology that you use to complete, you know, to, to do a fuller type of offering. And so an AI, multimodal, multimodal AI is very, very hot right now, and, and people realize they need to have multiple types of AI in order to really uh, be effective. And the same thing is happening with automation platforms, so we're adding that term to that. And when you look at, um, these are, these are um, when you look at the different stacks that are, have been emerging over the past 18 months or so, what you see are companies that were very, very good at process automation, very, very good at case management, intelligent document processing, are now making acquisitions to add task mining, process mining, and RPA. So that th at that point, these are almost like the labor stacks that really significantly uh, focus on automating labor in, in different ways. Below that, we're starting to see the, the convergence of RPA with integration, which is tip, you know, was sort of a standalone piece. And the other thing about integration modernization is that they're incorporating different technologies that really speed up how a business operates. So between RPA, which helps them complete a, an automation picture, and the, the, the streaming technologies that let them that speed up and drive, drive data into the organization on a continuous basis, they're supporting this faster rhythm in a business um, where people are really focused on monetizing speed and gaining competitive advantage. So for those of us who see messages when we do, you know, when we buy something um, from a, a, a digital commerce provider and they say, yes, we got your order, um, and they text us, or yes, it's an, on, on its shipment, yes, it landed at your door, 
then all of that is driven by these sorts of streaming technologies and messaging that communicate and give everyone the status quo of what's going on with the business that you're doing with this particular vendor. That is permeating, permeating organizations, and it's a major automation technology that changes how businesses operate. When you move up to the uh, process control and response automation, that is, built around the, that is built around how process mining is changing the nature of process mining and what it does. At this point, for organizations that are mature in process mining, they're very, very focused on monitoring. They're very, very focused on, on being able to monitor in fast enough speed so that they can take action when they see something going wrong in how their process is operating or how work is flowing through um, their operations or how transactions are being processed. And so from that perspective, um, we're seeing a lot of linkage of uh, process mining where you're thinking more end to end. So that if you are trying to fix one particular process area, you start finding that the problem is upstream somewhere else, and then problems that you fix that, and you find out there's problems upstream somewhere else. Now people are connecting how they're doing process mining together and, and, and overall together and allow you to uh, really remove a whole bunch of friction and respond immediately to problems or conditions uh, that are coming from monitoring coupled with the stream processing and event streaming capabilities. And that takes us to um, RPA platforms. To me, I've separated that, I keep that separate from hyper automation. Because with RPA platforms, that sort of is changing how we're working when you start looking at the evolution of how, how RPA platforms go. And in this case, what's happening is that with these other systems where you're effectively creating event-driven response systems, then you need to also have a just-in-time system to be able to receive tasks that you can immediately work on um, in, order to, in order to participate in being able to resolve things quickly. And that's where we're starting to see this introduction of robot assistants come in. That's a term I use to talk about the interface between a human and bots to be able to start interactively solving problems. And with those, you have a uni uniform, unified task inbox. You have uh, task forms and controls. You have all these bots working for you. An event comes into your inbox, and suddenly you say, OK, I need to take care of this right away. And um, the other thing that's interesting about task, uh, task um, robot assistance is that you can also trigger automations from that, from that particular asset as well. So it gives you the ability, when you start thinking about use it, utilizing that sort of newer technology of RPA, it gives you a way to be able to accept all the different changes in the organization and respond to them so that the business as a whole holistically operates better. So to, to finish it up, um, you know, what we learned from the um, economic impact is that it's really important to think about going big and broad with your automation. So automation works. It, it de delivers pretty significant results. So really focusing on, on um, making, making a big impact early is, is important at this point. And the other piece about that is that, um, that you know, it's, it's time to start thinking about business users and how they can also be involved in this. The second is that multimodal can be noisy. It's a really, really, the, 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 being able to evaluate what, what technology works best for you has exponentiated in complexity. So choose carefully. Focus on your strategic assets um, and not look at cost. Uh, because what we know is that cost is the smallest part. The return that you get from the automation matters. And so by focusing a lot on what your strategic technologies are and buying best of breed in that really matters quite a bit. And the third is that event-driven design is rapidly emerging. Orga every organization has some groups that have either lost business because they cannot compete on speed, or they're monetizing speed and winning business from everyone else. And when you see that sort of behavior, it changes how the company has to respond to things and how situationally aware people have to be. And that's the next frontier of automation as well, is to be able to figure out how to do this well. 
And so the robot assistant capability that's now part of UiPath and other of the RPA products become a really good mechanism for, for having people get involved with supporting the speed. And the other piece that you also need to start thinking a lot about for people doing development is just this amount of work you have to think about doing where you're, you're using strange things like, what's my trigger, you know, which is typically a negative thing for us when we think about it in our personal life. We don't want to be triggered. But with these systems, you want to trigger so that it, you, you see something happening, you want to trigger so that you can then start, you know, building an automation that can then respond. And so queuing is also another thing. So when you look at, for example, um, the different products, you're going to see all sorts of things in, those, um, in the studio environments to support this in terms of how you use that in automation. And so it, it would be time right now to start experimenting with that to see how you can then contribute to this monetization um, by, by really thinking about speed. And on that note, I'm going to turn this back over. And thank you for your time. <laughs>